Here we are folks, Alan Taylor with part three of the uh, vertical artery uh, videos. Hopefully now we move on to uh, directions for the future and you may be wondering why I'm stood here in this old ancient graveyard. Uh, if you've been watching the previous presentations, you'll have some idea that I've suggested that with the vertebral artery test, we might be using the wrong tools for the job and thinking about the problem in the wrong way. Let me try and explain uh, where I'm going with this. So if we're looking at risk assessment, uh, logically, um, one of the things we might want to do is consider starting with a vascular hypothesis. The reason for that is the, uh, the risk of going ahead with a, any treatment um, at all. Um, Maybe, maybe potentially high, particularly where there's been trauma. Uh, and what we can do is test that vascular hypothesis in various ways, uh, and until proven otherwise, then keep it in mind, uh, would be a very logical way to go with this. Uh, so at the end of the day, the risk we're looking at is um, a major serious adverse event, uh, which can be simply described as potentially TIA, stroke or death. Uh, and then the question for us all as clinicians will be how can we promote safe physiotherapy practice? And I've looked at this problem in the previous um, uh, presentations and we, we decided we probably couldn't see the wood for the trees, that the vertebral artery test was probably uh, causing us a little bit of a distraction. So what I think we should do is probably change the narrative. So the key thing is to shift the emphasis from VBI and manual therapy and begin to consider the big picture and then move down to sort of a logical way to move forward, which would be to shift the emphasis to vascular risk and thinking about how we might look at that. And and management of the cervical spine in general with any form of treatment at all. So let's look at the pieces of the jigsaw that are missing here and try and put it all together as best we're able. Some of the things we need to consider are whether we might want to add blood pressure uh, recording into the uh, physical examination. Certainly, um, many folks now will be using cranial nerve assessment, which would be really logical. It's always fascinated me that uh, in, in university, in, uh, in, in physiotherapy, we've, uh, we've been taught always to assess the, um, the upper limb and the lower limb if we suspected neurological compromise. Yet where it comes to the, the neck and the head and potential headache presentations, the cranial nerves were never a big part of the education. And hopefully that's changing now for the better. Blood pressure is fairly straightforward. Most folks are able to uh, take a, a blood pressure and the normative data or, or figures are there uh, for you. And also um, the high blood pressure levels are there as well. And obviously we've got to consider this sort of pre-hypertension ranges as well, which might be a, a reason for, for caution. But uh, certainly what I would do if I was a little bit unsure would be to go to the NICE guidance on blood pressure. And uh, it's very, very easy to see where you would need to go with your decision making from there. I've mentioned cranial nerves. Again, most people will be familiar with these, but uh, myself and Roger Kerry think that probably if you got really slick at this, you could probably get it down to a two, maybe three minute screening examination where you pull all these tests together and um, are able to see if there are any uh, unusual findings. It's worth remembering though that the cranial nerves on their own will not give you the answer to the question that you're looking for. Many of these uh, impending strokes and vascular presentations will only present with cranial nerve manifestations in probably 15 to 20% of cases. So again, this is not the answer, it's just part of the thinking around the problem. Let's look at these cases that we uh, we considered. So there was Mayumi. Um, Mayumi had a, a false negative uh, VBI test. And I talked about that in the last presentation and that was linked to uh, not testing him in his functional testing position, which was the uh, bow hunter's position. And that was possibly the reason for his negative test. And we saw um, that a functional test would find some of his symptoms so you would have been able to find uh, or see some nystagmus uh, on eye movements and he certainly started to report his symptoms of feeling slightly unusual and dizziness and uh, uh, and even an impending feeling of, uh, of, of, of losing consciousness and heading towards drop attack if we'd left him in that position for a long period of time. Case two, Phil, 
this was a really interesting one. The, Phil went on to be a, an actual presentation of a dissecting carotid artery. Obviously, the VBI test was completely inappropriate there because it wasn't testing the right artery. Uh, it was looking completely at the, the wrong thing. So this is a good example of why uh, we have to consider all of the arteries, all of the potential presentations that we might see and not just concentrate on vertebral artery and not just concentrate on one uh, pathology. Um, it turns out if you had tested Phil's blood pressure, it was exceptionally high and that would have alerted you probably to triage this patient on. Um, and, and if you tested the cranial nerves, you would have found some um, abnormal cranial nerve findings as well at 9, 10 and 12. Mrs. Miggins, she was an interesting case. Um, negative VBI test again, again because the VBI test was totally inappropriate in this case. Uh, there was vascular risk, but the vascular risk was from the carotid arteries. This lady was having physiotherapy-induced um, transient ischemic attacks, and they were of carotid origin. So um, hopefully, uh, thankfully, should we say, uh, that was picked up um by the vascular surgeon and and the key thing for her was really that um, the subjective history was enough to alert you to the fact that this could have been a possibility anyway which is already under the care of the vascular consultant for a peripheral vascular disease which should have put on your radar of a potential vascular hypothesis her blood pressure was okay uh, but in this case a, an additional um, examination technique would have been auscultation of the carotid arteries in, and that's what the vascular surgeon did and with his skilled ability he was able to pick up a brewery or an, a sound of abnormal uh, turbulence in the vessel and that convinced him to send her for ultrasound scan and she was found to have this um, narrowing of the carotid arteries and she was having small uh, ischemic events due to um, the um, movement of, of, of small clots fr from that area of plaque within the vessels there. Lisa, she's the really interesting one. This is the one you're going to see most of all. Um, and well, if you decided to do a, a VPI test, then that would have been negative. But you were uh, by now would have been slightly unsure of whether you could trust that vertebral artery test. Uh, but you would have st still been quite puzzled by these um, sort of red flag type symptoms, which were the visual disturbances dizziness the headache the, this nausea that she described uh, and these sort of feel, these, these unusual feelings so for her um, we've got to decide whether this dizziness these visual disturbances and the nausea are, are, are actually uh, bona fide red flags or whether uh, and whether there is risk or not before we decide how to go ahead uh, and I think this is a really common case that you'll see in your clinics often many of you will treat um, whiplash associated disorder and these are those really tricky symptoms that we're not quite sure about and in this case um, again wondering about the vertebral artery test may or may not uh, probably not as you'll see uh, be helpful at this point so let's think it through and, and I'm trying to illustrate why the vertebral artery test can sometimes distract us. I'm asking the question actually, does, does this stuff that the Australian Physiotherapy Association actually even make sense? They're suggesting the vertebral artery test should be used if symptoms are unclear. Um, and then they also say never provoke dizziness or other VBI symptoms in, treat, in treatment. Okay, And that's difficult to uh, decipher you know I think one of the things you might want to do certainly is consider whether you might want to provoke dizziness in certain ways in, and in much safer ways to see if you can work out what's going on with some of these patients the reason the vertebral artery test doesn't make sense is because often dizziness symptoms visual symptoms feelings of unsteadiness um, uh, ocular motor issues seem to be linked especially after trauma and this is from the whiplash uh, injury um, research but much of it done by Julia Trelevan uh, and the suggestion is and it's early um, evidence but it's certainly uh, it's certainly out there uh, and if you look at it, look at this in your clinics you may well find that it's uh, really useful to you the suggestion is that there's a, there's a there's a mismatch of uh, information relating to proprioceptive input related to 
input from the eyes, input from the vestibular system, and this may go on to also have sort of impact on the on the balance system as well. So if you think about that, if you do this vertebral artery test, what you've done by moving the head all the way like that, you've actually moved three out of those four sensory motor input systems. So you moved the proprioceptive system, you moved probably the eyes, and you certainly moved the vestibular apparatus. And of course, by doing that, you've also stressed the, the vascular tissues by moving the head and neck in the way that you have. Feeling confused? Well, you probably would be, um, because by now, Having done that, how would you know actually, unless you were very, very skilled and you could interpret some of these very, very subtle things related to sort of nystagmus and eye movements, what was going on? So the question is, is there more to this than meets the eye or eyes in this case? And I think there's a very strong suggestion that we should be looking a lot more at patients' eyes. I think one of the things we need to do is begin to lose the fear over time. So we've heard all of this risk uh, data. Uh, if you look at Rick Cronenberg's work, you'll know that actually the, the, the risks are not massive. Um, it's very rare to get a problem with the um, vascular system. Uh, but occasionally we know these things are out there and we've got to be the people that can screen for these sorts of things. To help you do that, consider the big picture underneath the umbrella of cervical arterial dysfunction. Remind yourself that the vertebral artery is not the only artery that we need to consider. Consider the carotid and consider all of the pathologies that you might encounter. And also mechanisms. It's not just about pathology, it's about mechanisms. There are anatomical anomalies and there are flow limitations that can occur without pathology. Okay, so there's a nice list of... Um, different types of things that you may see and of course things like temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis are another form of vascular um, consideration that we may encounter in clinics. So I think we've worked out what the problem is by now hopefully and uh, I think we've worked out that the vertebral artery test is probably not a viable risk assessment tool and that in many cases it may actually serve as a distraction um, and if you look at some of the um, presentations that I've done for Trust Me Ed, you'll see a little bit more information on how we can move forward on this and start to look, as I've said, at the ways we can examine the eyes and the uh, sensory motor system in, in a much more meaningful way. But if you think about what I've said and realize that doing the vertebral artery test immediately moves all of those different systems we've probably confused ourselves rather than actually helped ourselves. And I learned this from a patient. Uh, patients often tell us stuff and do stuff that makes uh, changes to our uh, clinical practice. And uh, the one that I remember most of all, it was a, it was a police lady who'd been involved in a road traffic accident. She was in a terrible state with pain and uh, the, the, the car had uh, rolled over. It had hit a sort of brick wall. There'd been all sorts of different things happen. And she got all these different injuries. She got headaches, she got neck pain, she got reduced range of motion, she got other peripheral injuries too. But the thing that was bothering her most was this dizziness and nausea that she'd had since the um, um, accident. And it was relatively recent. It was in the last two to three weeks and she came into the clinic uh, and told me this story. And um, instead of doing the vertebral artery test, I decided to uh, do some eye examination. And during the eye examination, um, symptoms were immediately brought on uh, within a few seconds or so of doing some of the um, tests that you're able to do uh, looking at the eyes uh, and she burst into tears and once I'd uh, given her the, uh, the, the the tissues and sort of uh, given her some reassurance that everything would be okay I said well what, what was it that made you burst into tears like that and she said well I've been to the doctors, the doctor said I got a virus and I knew it wasn't a virus and I, I was really worried about this dizziness and I knew I'd had the road traffic accident, I thought there was something serious. And, and then my family was starting to disbelieve me that I felt dizzy and sort of saying I was making too much of it. And then she said, and now you've suddenly made me go dizzy by just moving my eyes and I now realize that there's a mechanism by which I can become dizzy.
So the dizziness passed, the tears passed, and we went on and looked at one or two other things and then uh, put together a, a management program for this lady and she made a, a, a very, very rapid recovery from both the dizziness, the nausea, and lots of her uh, presentations of, of pain and discomfort. And she made a very, very good and quick recovery after that initial examination. I learned a lot from that case. Uh, and I think uh, sometimes single case studies are really helpful to help us problem solve these sorts of things. With that story, um, I'm going to tell you what the solution is. The solution is consider the big picture. Listen to the patient's narrative. Listen to what they've got to tell you. Listen to what their concerns are. Consider, if you're looking still for the risk, consider all the four vessels. Consider all the potential mechanisms. That include the vascular mechanisms and other potential mechanisms, such as sensory motor. Don't move all of the systems all in one go, which is what the vertebral artery test does. Uh, use a range of tests and don't rely on anyone, whether it be cranial nerves or anything else for that matter, and then begin to lose the fear about how you approach this problem. I think we can really can move forward on this risk assessment uh, with that. And above all, lots of these papers have pertained to manual therapy. It's not just about manual therapy. It doesn't matter what you do, what sort of um, treatments you apply to these patients, whether it's rehabilitation, whether it's pain management strategies, whether it's education, it doesn't matter. You still need to do your risk assessment. The key thing with every patient that walks through the door is that we try to ascertain whether these uh, symptoms they've got, which may be red flag symptoms or maybe not, are something that we need to act upon or not. And the key problem in all of these cases, when we look at medico legal cases that where the wrong decisions have been made, is basically that delays to diagnosis have often been made or treatment interventions have been done which are inappropriate considering the clinical picture. And we've got to get our clinical reasoning right so that we're able to uh, address all of that. I hope that's cleared up some of the mysteries around the risk assessment. So why do we come to the graveyard? You might be asking. Well, I think it's time. It's been nearly f four decades. Uh, it's time that a vertebral artery test was left in the graveyard of uh, old uh, ineffective tests and we moved on and found some different ways to do this risk assessment. Hopefully what I've brought to you is some, uh, some ideas of how you can apply things clinically and think about the, uh, the issues of dizziness and nausea uh, and all those unusual visual symptoms and think about addressing them in a different way without necessarily having recourse to this uh, very, very unreliable test. Thanks for listening, folks. Uh, don't forget to look up uh, the extra resources on Trust Me Ed and also look out for the new uh, cervical spine risk and rehabilitation courses coming from myself and uh, Roger Kerry in the very, very near future.